It's good to greet you this morning as we share together in worship. Whether we're worshipping from home or at Clydebank Salvation Army, it's good that I have this opportunity to share in ministry with you. This morning, we continue in our series of looking at the life of individuals within the early church. And perhaps today we come to one of the most well-known within the Acts of the Apostles, that being Saul, who became Paul. I've shared this probably with you before during worship, that within my own life there have been a number of spiritual giants, all linked to my home church, which is Valesworth Salvation Army, but two specific people. I often think of Jean, who took the children's choir, even up until the years before she was promoted to glory, still passing on those words of, of, of wisdom, encouragement and knowledge. And also a fab guy who looked after me in my teens, Alan. Even to this day, the messages that come from my parents, just to say, Alan has shared this word, Alan has been asking for you. Even though Jean has passed away, she is very much still a spiritual giant within my life. As we look at the life of the early church, we do see on many occasions those people who came to know Jesus, who became change agents. And even as, even as we look at the life of Saul, who we know through the scripture was later named Paul, the one who shamed the church, the one who was despicable in his actions. He was still used and called by God. If you don't remember anything else of what I share with you today, remember this. In the hands of Jesus, no matter what we have done, we can all be forgiven, restored and used by God to make a difference, not only in our own lives, but the people that we come into contact with. And so one person can make a difference in our lives and we can make a difference to each other. So as we think of a person who would have been the ideal candidate for the job, would Saul have been that person? Be honest in how you respond to that question. But remember that God could see in Saul the very impossible that would become possible. If you think back to the meeting last Sunday led by Adam and Karen, they shared with you Stephen's encounter with Jesus. But also within this, we know the very persecution that was Saul's. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we, f we find these words that Saul approved to the stoning of Stephen and continued persecution of the Christians. Now Saul agreed to that. And from that day on, a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem began. All the believers scattered into the countryside of Judea and among the Samaritans, except the apostles who remained behind in Jerusalem. God-fearing men gave Stephen a proper burial and mourned greatly over his death. Then Saul mercilessly persecuted the church of God, going from house to house into the homes of believers to arrest both men and women and drag them into prison. So let's be honest, think about it carefully. If you would have been putting that job description together, would Saul have been the right candidate for the job? Especially for the one who in due course, like ourselves, would take on the name of Christian and become a follower of the way. I think whatever our view on this account within the scripture, God uses many unlikely candidates to carry out his work. 
if we were to look into perhaps a more modern day history of the church, we may be able to understand this a bit further. During the 1904 Welsh revival, we find that the revival in the church in North Wales was not was not started by a man of learning, but by a former coal miner. The Salvation Army itself started by two people, not with a university degree, but a heart full for God, and we know them by name, William and Catherine Booth. Was Saul an ideal candidate for the job? At face value, we would say an emphatic no. He was breathing, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He asked for letters from the high priest to kill within the Christian community. We know he agreed to the stoning of Stephen. You could actually say that at this point, Saul really lived to persecute the church. And maybe within Saul, was there just this great anger at seeing the success of the church before him? So why Damascus? Why was Saul on this particular journey? We know that he had been given the letters from the high priests that gave him the authority to persecute the, the Christians. And so this is why he was on his journey. Saul, a Pharisee, making a request of the Sadducees to persecute the disciples of Christ. Later in Acts chapter 26 and verse 10, we find these words. And that's exactly what I did in Jerusalem. For I not only imprisoned many of the holy believers by the authorities of the chief priests, I also cast my vote against them, sentencing them to death. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 25, we also see that Paul continues to persecute those of Damascus to bring them back to Jerusalem and to be punished. At this point, Saul is definitely not looking like he's going to be the influencer that could be used by God. But then something dynamic, something that is truly beautiful, something that perhaps some of us may never get to experience happened. Saul was blinded, as we know in the scriptures, by a light. This light and the voice that spoke to him that would change his life the life of the church and our lives forever. And so in the reading that has already been shared with us, we see that Paul gets this very unexpected wake-up call. Or was it unexpected? In Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 7, we will have already heard the words that Saul was outside the city there was a brilliant light that flashed before him from heaven. And within this, he heard the booming voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul replied, who are you, Lord? And he hears the words, I am Jesus, the victorious, the one you are persecuting. Now get up. And go into the city where you will be told what to do. Saul very much in that moment receives his wake up call. I wonder if you can remember that time for yourself when you heard the voice from God. The date, the time, the place maybe when you committed your life to Christ and you followed him. You knew in that one moment that God had come close to you and using a terminology that perhaps we don't use these days, we gave our heart to Christ. 
I can remember that very clearly for myself, the time, the place, the date. For me, it was at South Yorkshire School of Music, July 1987. I can even remember the person who led me to Christ. But for me, the, all, the other importance that evening was that that was also my call to ministry as a Salvation Army officer. Saul heard the voice and says, who are you, Lord? At that moment, he doesn't recognize that the person that has spoke to him is indeed the risen Christ. Jesus tells Saul who he is and asks, why is he persecuting him? Did you catch that? Jesus is saying when one persecutes one of his, they are also persecuting him. So for Saul, we can very clearly see his encounter with Jesus begin. He'd been on a path that was very much contrary to the one by which that had been desired already for him by God. We know that as he came to follow this path, he followed a very life-changing event and encounter for him. Saul knew big time that he was on the wrong path. He had not only been persecuting the Christians, but he had also been persecuting the church. Jesus was going to offer Saul in this moment a new life, a new way. And how instrumental Saul, later to become Paul, was in the life of the early church and today. Paul had received his wake-up call, but part of this was also a wake-up call to mission. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ... He has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh. Everything is new. This Damascus Road experience for Paul saw the beginning of what could have seemed to have been the very impossible job description become very possible. But we don't finish the story there. Paul, as he is now known, is told to do the following. Now get up and go into the city where you will be told what you are to do. Saul stood to his feet and even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind. So the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. For three days, he didn't eat or drink and couldn't see a thing. But, you know, we have a God who doesn't keep this good plan of Saul's life and the life that was to come to himself. And so a conversation begins with Ananias. And he tells him that he wants him to get up and go to the house of Judas. Think about the words Ananias speaks in Acts chapter 9. But Lord, many people have told me about this terrible persecution of those in Jerusalem who are devoted to you. In fact, the high priest has authorised him to seize and imprison all those in Damascus who call upon your name. Doesn't this seem to be a little bit crazy, bearing in mind the kind of person that Ananias had been led to believe that Saul is? What would your response be if you had heard those words from God being told to go and speak to a person who had been so despicable against the church. Like Ananias, would you not have questioned God? 
But Ananias very much responds to the voice and straight away, as the Passion Translation tells us, he went straight away to a street called Abundance. And there he found Paul. Ananias responds very clearly to the challenge, just as Saul did on the Damascus Road when he was told to get up and to stop the persecution. In this moment, when Ananias goes to visit, we see that the mission of the church begins to open up even more. It extends and Paul becomes an influencer. In Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, we find the words, The Lord Yahweh answered him, Arise and go. I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. He will be brought before kings, before many nations, and before the Jewish people to give the revelation of who I am. And I will show him how much he is destined to suffer because of his passion for me. Acts chapter 9 goes on to tell us how Paul's sight was restored to him, but also then how he began to communicate and share in the ministry of Jesus. In words from Acts chapter 9 that we haven't shared this morning, within the hour he was in the synagogue, preaching about Jesus and proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God. Those who heard him were astonished, saying among themselves, isn't this the Saul who furiously persecuted those in Jerusalem who called on the name of Jesus? Didn't he come here with permission from the high priest to drag them off and take them as prisoners? Paul, a new man, a new man with a mission, takes food to eat in the house that he is in, regains his strength and then begins his own journey of mission and ministry that had been commissioned to him on the Damascus Road. We know from the reading of the Acts and the letters to the early church, that Paul made a big difference in many people's lives. And in Acts chapter 26 and verse 19, he reveals this for himself before King Agrippa, when he says, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. The very people that Paul had persecuted were to be the ones that he would share his life, the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus with. A man totally changed on hearing and receiving the word of God. And so in conclusion, can one person make a difference? You bet one person can. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote a great deal of the New Testament. The man who received that unlikely call, the voice from God, the unlikely call to mission, was indeed used by God. He made a difference. Can we make a difference? Most definitely, if we believe that we can. But are we open to God and allowing God to speak into our lives? We each have a choice to make, but what is our choice today? Can you, like Paul, say, I was and I am obedient to the call of God upon my life. Just where we are today, it's important that we make our own response to God. And I just want to share the first verse and the chorus of a song. I, the Lord of sea and sky, 
I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? And the chorus reminds us, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold my people in my heart. Just to say to you again, Paul made a difference. What is the difference that you will make in people's lives today? Let's pray together. Loving Father God, we thank you Thank you once again for the opportunity that is ours to meet together around your word today. Lord, may we indeed have been blessed and may we continue to be blessed as we open your word. And Lord, just like Paul and so many people before us in the early church, in the churches we grew up in, in our church here in Clyde Bank, May we indeed make a difference in people's lives by our faith and by our actions. And Lord, today, if you say to us, not necessarily in a blinding light, but just by your voice, I want you to be used in ministry today. May we indeed respond to that voice. Amen. Amen.